Why don't people believe that? I mean, with respect to everyone in the room, we see a lot of pilots, we see as in pilot use cases, studies, prototypes, things that are heavily regulated either by the FAA in the air or different regulators on the ground. Why do investors, market commentators look at your research and say, we don't believe you, Kathy Wood? Well, it's interesting. This all started with Tesla, too, and Bitcoin. Those wow, we got those, to Tesla yeah, pretty quick. Great. Yes, it does. No, but uh, Bitcoin in 2015, Tesla 2014-15, and, and we had what seemed like a crazy estimate out there. Uh, but it was all it was all modeled, very data driven. And I think what the market's missing is uh, they they are not focusing on something called Wright's law. Wright's law is a relative of Moore's law. Moore's law is a function of time. Wright's law is a function of units. And it says for every cumulative doubling in the number of units produced, costs decline at a consistent rate. Uh, Theodore Wright was a civil uh, aeronautics engineer, and he observed during the early days of airplane manufacturing this this law. And so, if you if you and, and back then, I think the cost, Sam, correct me if I'm wrong, is 10 percent roughly for every cumulative doubling in the number of airplanes manufactured. You fast forward to today, and uh, in robotics, industrial robotics, that number is 50 percent. If you look at battery technology, that number is 28%. Uh, DNA sequencing, which is, I know, not in this uh, room, but 40%, 28% for short reads. So these are massive deflationary trends um, evolving all at the same time. So we're going to see S-curves feeding S-curves, and I think we'll see it in space, especially. For a lot of potential investors in the room, Stuart Walton, where is Stuart? Is he here? We had a conversation on Monday where he made the same point. I asked him kind of what's changed from the last UP Summit, and now we've had the pandemic era, but he basically explained it as being this big wave and ramp up in innovation, technological innovation. But what he followed on to say is that there is now a tremendous influx of capital willing to invest in this area. The public markets might actually dispute that, but, but do you agree with Stuart that, that the capital is there to meet the innovation and the scale that you think is going to happen? Uh, the capital will be there uh, once, uh, and now I'm saying both in the public and private market. I think in the private market what, what we're seeing, and this is a throwback to that 2018 conference, which was we remember one VC venture capital leader after another getting up on stage and saying, oh, we would never invest in this. This is too high fixed cost. This is too long term. Or, well, there, were, there were many excuses. Uh, and so it's been very interesting. There, there is a, a lot of capital moving into the asset light part of the business and, and still maybe an aversion to the more hardware centric. Uh, but we do think that will change over time. Let's talk about public markets. There has been volatility in public markets. There has been underperformance in higher multiple, sometimes pre-revenue, often pre-profit companies. But thematically, they are in mobility, EV and battery-related startups, LIDAR-related startups, mobility startups that went public via a SPAC. Why is that? Uh, why did they go public versus No, public? why have they performed so poorly oh, in the first half so of this year? Okay, so innovation generally, um, starting in February of 21, that was our peak. Um, innovation has been, for want of a better word, trashed. And the reason is... What do you uh, mean by that? Could you that what I mean is, I'll give you the backdrop here. So if you look at uh, our, our performance, our flagship's performance from the low in COVID to the peak in February of 21. That was 360% increase. Innovation solves problems. We had a lot of problems through the coronavirus. Innovation solves problems. We were rewarded accordingly. Since then, peak to trough, when we hit our trough, thank goodness we're past it, down 75%. Why? Inflation and interest rates. So there is this, and it's really interesting to be here, um, Walmart territory, because I think we're learning a lot from the retailers now. And we're talking about what we learned about inventories. Inventories, right. yes. Uh, so uh, the fear of rising interest rates uh, and inflation out of control 
has gripped the market. And of course, and, and that's the equity market. If you look at the fixed income market, it does not agree with this. Yeah. The three-year, I mean, the 10-year treasury bond yield is 3%. Uh, that, that instrument should be one of the most responsive to inflation fears, right? So 3% which suggests GDP growth 3 to 4% during the next 10 years. So it's not being corroborated by the fixed income markets. And I don't think, I don't think that we are in an, a period where we can't extricate ourselves from this. In fact, the inventory stories are a very good example of why, of why inflation has become a problem. You know, the scrambling to bring more and more inventory to satisfy demand, stay-at-home demand, went into overdrive, and I believe the narrative in the last year, inflation, uh, gave purchasing managers this idea that, okay, what's the worst that could happen if I build inventories? The worst that could happen is that I'm able to deliver inventory profits, sell at a higher price. Well, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. When we see, I've never seen inventory um, uh, surges like this in my career, and I've been around for a long time. So 33% uh, uh, at Walmart, 42% uh, at, uh, at Target, 74% uh, at, uh, no, 50% at Kohl's. So very broad based. Uh, and so I think we're going to see a lot of discounting. And, this, and what's beginning to happen now, just at the margin, uh, and we're seeing it because our strategy is now starting to outperform. Uh, the, the rest of the market. I've never been in a market where the market has gone to new highs and we are hitting lows. I've never been in a market. So there's been, a, a, and it hasn't been supported by the fixed income market. So we'll see what happens. Uh, I, I would, ARC offers a number of products, but ARC Innovation, ticker ARKK, is everyone sees on that. And when you said, I want to clarify, Mo, you said it's been trashed. You mean its reputation, but it's performed poorly year to day. You have seen net inflows of money, yes. broadly speaking. Yeah. Uh, not, perhaps not as much as you'd like, but what does that tell you, despite performance and drawdown related to weak performance, that investors continue to put money there? I think investors trust us. They know we're doing the work. We're giving our research away. We're beginning to give our models away. We have Tesla up on GitHub. Today or tomorrow, we're going to publish another one, which I can't say until after the close. We are going to play, play the ground war here to help people understand what during the next five years is going to happen to these, to these companies. Uh, so your original question was, why are they staying with us? They trust us. They trust our research. We're doing research that others are not doing. We're okay. sharing it with everyone, both the top-down you know, modeling as well as now the bottom-up modeling. And we want people, uh, investors, skeptics, uh, to poke holes into our models. We you leave, welcome that. Oh, yeah. We leave the variables open. If you think we're crazy on this assumption, you change it then and see what the price target is. Let's see what the sensitivity to each assumption is. And I think our clients really like that. And I also will say, we see this, I'm going to say it's across the board, but especially young people, they know that we are researching the future and They're not the past. They're talking about young investors who young are investors, deploying capital. But we are... We are researching the future. If you look at what has happened to our industry, it really lost the plot after the tech and telecom bust and then the 0809 meltdown. Uh, we had this tremendous risk aversion, business risk, career risk, and a movement towards passive and benchmark style investing. And I have been quoted as saying, and I know Eric Balchunas at... Uh, at um, I think Eric Balchunas is listening. I know okay. that Eric Balchunas hey, Eric. is listening. So yeah. whatever you have to say he, about him, please go right ahead. Yeah. <laughs> he, um, he, he would disagree with this because he thinks it's actually a good thing that all of this passive and benchmark has happened for us. And I agree with that to some extent. But in terms of allocating capital to its highest and best use... I don't think looking backwards is going to work. So I'm really thinking about the competitiveness of the United States when I say that. Not about us. Yes, I think we will shine because we are looking at the future, and the future is very bright for all kinds of reasons. Let me just point out to the audience here in the room at Up Summit in Bentonville, Arkansas, and those listening around the world on Bloomberg Television Radio, I keep looking at my phone. And the reason I do is I'm on the Bloomberg Terminal. It's a down day in equity markets. 
but the ARK Innovation ETF is up 2.7%. Why is that? I, I think it is uh, uh, seeping into the investor's mind is, wait a minute, are we right on this inflation call? They felt so right uh, because supply chain issues uh, extended for such a long time. Then Russia invades Ukraine. You know, of course, and of course, monetary and fiscal policy had been so stimulative. But as I've said many times, we think the greatest ris greater risk by far is deflation. Deflation cyclically. But you're because, talking over a longer time horizon. I'm talking about now, too, because I think this inventory issue highlights the cyclical reason we've been saying we think inflation will unravel. The secular deflation story is very powerful. And, and, and as EVs and uh, uh, autonomous mobility of all stripes starts becoming a bigger base in the economy, that deflationary pull is going to be aggregated because again, these are convergences between and among right. different technologies that are all on their own deflationary cost curves. La, I, I should point out as well to those listening and those in the room, Eric Bautunas is our Bloomberg Intelligence and ETF we love Eric. Re research lead. <laughs> and if you are a Bloomberg subscriber, I, I highly recommend reading his research. Right. Um, last night, we all gathered in a room and John Ferner, the CEO of Walmart's US division talks about the new normal and how we don't know what the new normal is yet. One of the things that you have talked about is the misallocation of capital into index products. Bear with me on this one. But in, in many cases, you think about why people deploy money, 401k, diversifying their assets, and, and some index give you diversification. Are, are you essentially saying that, that Kathy Wood and ARK Invest, the wider firm, want the responsibility of holding onto people's assets with a very clear thematic focus. Yes, and I'm not saying every, I, I'm not saying investors should put 100% of their equity exposure into ARC. Now, is my own personal portfolio like that? Yes, but I wouldn't suggest it for most because okay. this is a truly volatile strategy. So we have a study up on our site which says if you allocate five to 10% of your equity allocation to uh, this kind of strategy, innovation, solely innovation, you will increase your returns per unit of risk over a five-year period. Okay? Okay. And very important is five-year period. We are the closest you'll find to a venture capital fund in the public equity markets. And of course, uh, we're acting like it. Uh, in fact, we, we led this VC down round. You know, the VC down rounds that we're seeing now were led by the public markets. Now, I don't think the public markets have this right at all. I think that we are in bargain basement ter territory in terms if you give us a five-year investment time horizon. We are a deep value portfolio. Um, I think the private markets are closer to right. But there was a wall of money pushing in, and there was some bad behavior, so we are in a reset here. Okay. I don't think we'll go down to public market valuations. I think, I think that we'll see a, kind of an adjustment both ways. Uh, over the last three days here at UpSubit, Bentonville, Arkansas, I've, I've enjoyed the broad spectrum of technology on display. A lot of it's physical, so you can see it and so you understand it. For those in the room, who aren't familiar with Kathy Wood, she is known for bold predictions. I kind of teed this one up earlier. Perhaps one of your boldest predictions is the idea that artificial intelligence will drive massive global GDP growth. I think your forecast is 50% over a 10-year time horizon, a decade. Could you, could you explain that to us? So the, um, uh, we, we pay attention to a site called Metaculus, which... Um, uh, basically, anyone can put their forecasts in there, but they are basically graded over time. And um, if you look at, at since, um, since OpenAI released Dolly 2, found foundation model in AI, and uh, I think Google's version, Alphabet's version is Flamingo, that, um, that service has gone from flat, when, when do you think artificial, artificial general intelligence will occur? It's been flat for the last two years, but since those two models have come out, um, the, the time that, that these forecasters expect to see uh, artif uh, artificial general intelligence has shrunk from 30 to 50 years to 6 to 12 years. So. Now, 
you know, it, it, it sounds impossible to think that GDP growth, sort of that 3% three, three, three uh, in real terms and so forth, uh, is going to accelerate to 30%. But if you look at the history over thousands of years, you will see that at one point in time, GDP in the economy, now this is thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. I wasn't around then, okay. so I, yeah. 0.003%, <laughs> uh, then for another thousand years, 0 0.003, then 0 0.03. Uh, then 3%. Who's to say we aren't close? I just mentioned these S-curves feeding one another and, and the market's not being set up for it, you know, really looking to the past for an indication of where we're going in the future. It's going to be a real blindside for some well, companies. I'd like to talk about some specific examples which you and I have discussed previously, but I want to ask you this because we're going a little long. I don't think anyone in the room minds us going a little long. Is that okay? We're all good. So... Do you ever just sit at your desk in St. Petersburg, Florida, and think, maybe I should tone this, this bold prediction down? It's too much for potential investors in our products to, to believe. You know, the 50% the, the GDP growth call, I'm not an economist, but yeah. what? It's kind of crazy. It seems crazy. Do you admit it? Yeah, it seems crazy, but I, I, I'll tell you, when we first did our Tesla projections, when we first did our Bitcoin projections, these were early, early signs that we're on to something here, right? And we, I would look at those forecasts, and, and uh, Sam and Tasha were responsible, and I was saying, wow, this is a tall order. And what did we see? We, it's playing out so, so much closer to what we were expecting than to what IHS, which is the auto forecaster out there, was expecting. Just to give you an idea, idea here. In 2014-15, when we, when we were starting our, our tes intensive Tesla work, um, IHS was predicting for 2022 that the number of electric vehicles uh, sold globally in 2022 would be 250,000. Okay. Last year, it was 4.8 million. This year, It'll be okay, what did they get wrong that you got right on they're, that? They're probably listening to the traditional auto manufacturers too much. Okay. Uh, that they, they, they were listening to the forecasters within those organizations when we're moving away from the internal combustion engine. That was the wrong place to look. Okay. And towards battery technology, and they weren't paying attention to the advances in battery technology, thanks to Elon uh, uh, and others, uh, as well as the cost declines in batteries, they also weren't paying attention to how quickly China would move. China is okay. moving aggressively towards From electric vehicles. From a policy vehicles. support perspective, if anything. Yes, I believe it is, its sales now are up to 18% uh, electric vehicles, and that's out of 25 million or so. And it's a dramatic above Ramp. the United I mean, States as well. Yes, the and current I think levels. We're, we're in the low single digit range. We are running out of time, but I am going to push it, and we've got to talk about Elon, and we've got to talk about Twitter. Elon Musk is interesting, understatement of the century. And we're very focused the last few days. I've had conversations here about Twitter and what's going on. But as you know, I cover the automotive sector as well, and, and Tesla is part of my day-to-day -day coverage. Is there an element of key man risk with Elon Musk behaving the way that he does? Well, I think people have been saying that uh, all along with Tesla because of SpaceX. Right, and he's split of in his responsibility. And, and Neuralink. And, I mean, he is our renaissance man. But it has ramped up quite a lot, hasn't it? It has. It has. But he is, you know, as you scale a Tesla, they've got that manufacturing scaling under control now. The next challenge there and what he is, I think, sticking around for, he doesn't need to stick around for the EV side of it, he needs to stick around for the autonomous side. So he and Andre Karpathy together. So let's bring it back to artificial intelligence. Yes. Why is that important? Why does he need to stick around because, for that? Because uh, for Tesla and any and cruise automation and Waymo, this is the biggest transportation opportunity out there. It is, a, as I mentioned before, think about this, $10 trillion in revenue versus zero now by 2030, right? And that's ox. Full case or still base case scenario? That's our base case scenario. Okay. So uh, uh, nine to ten trillion dollars in revenues. So I don't think we've seen a bigger opportunity for one, and it's not just one sector. Again, there's a convergence going on. 
between and among technologies and sectors. Autonomous taxi networks are, you know, they're robotics, energy storage, and artificial intelligence. Right. Right? So. I'm going to keep going for about five more minutes. Cyrus, I've got about three more questions that, that I just would regret not asking. Let's, first is a mechanics issue, really, but Tesla, what's so fascinating is the retail investor interest, and there's a potential another stock split on the horizon. Can you just give your opinion on that, about you know, the, the Tesla sort of monumental gain, the issue of stock split, and then more people trying to have ownership of that stock? Well, I think uh, you know, retail was there way before institutional. And see, this is a perfect example of what's gone wrong. Uh, many institutions couldn't even think about uh, putting Tesla in uh, their portfolios until it got into an index. It got into an index when it was $500 billion. Think about all of the alpha generation that institutions made uh, uh, left on the table, but retail investors enjoyed. I think retail investors are feeling empowered. They know more about the future than institutions do, and they know we're doing the right work. And so I, I think that's why they were there early, and they will be early into everything we're doing, uh, because they really love to learn, and they're a part of the future. They have one foot in the new world. They're going to make it. So they're excited about it. So, and they are willing to put up, I've been shocked, how many, how many people, and it's not just young people, but come, come up to me and say, we're down 75%. They say, thank you. And I'm saying, whoa, you know, this would not happen. Uh, of course, they enjoyed the big gains right. uh, before that uh, because they are long-term in their time horizon. They are long-term. They really believe we are on to something big. Are they more risk-averse or less risk-averse, I should say? I think, you know, when, when, I, when I listen to the controversy about accredited investors and non-accredited investors, you know, when I think about what that really should mean, who knows more, um, it's not fair that we are blocking these young people, uh, most who don't have the income or asset thresholds, because they're not accredited, so they don't get access to innovation. So we're trying to change that, again, closest to a, pub, uh, a venture capital fund in the in the public equity markets, and we're going to start a, 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 a crossover fund. I can't talk about it. It's an oh, interval fund. Come on. No, it's what? in the SEC. They, I, I'm not messing with it. Okay, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, let's, move let's, let's move on. Let's move on.